Very welcome, everybody, to this session on growing or scaling your uh, nature-based enterprise. Um, before we get started, just quick housekeeping, uh, same as all the other sessions. Uh, this session will be recorded and uh, the recording will be made available uh, afterwards. Um, I, I think it'll be up on the Connecting Nature website from next week, hopefully. So um, in our session today, we're really looking at the potential well, we know there's massive poten potential out there for uh, nature-based enterprises um, to scale at the moment. There's a, a lot of increasing demand for nature-based solutions from the public sector and hopefully um, from the private sector, um, more private sector um, investment will be coming on board. So the question really is how can nature-based enterprises um, scale? And um, there's an, a lot of different questions around that and there's a lot of different models for scaling and that's really what we hope to address in our session here this uh, this afternoon I think we're afternoon yes um, so um, we are delighted to welcome a, a, a panel of speakers who are going to go through this topic and um, so we have two presentations one at the start one at the end uh, Joanne is going to be starting off Joanne is the head of innovation strategy and LGI sustainable innovation and she will prove be just providing an introductory overview into the kind of options for scaling. Uh, then we'll go to Colm O'Driscoll, uh, who some of you might have heard from yesterday. He's also the ambassador for the sustainable forestry uh, cluster on the Connecting Nature Enterprise platform. But uh, he did have a life before that <laughs> and a very a busy life outside of that um, uh, in Eti4 in Italy, um, where um, I first spoke to Colin when they were involved in ET4 in setting up EcoStar, which was the first uh, accelerator for nature-based enterprises that we're aware of. And they were backed by Fledge Investment, which is a US impact investor. So we'll be talking to Colin about what kind of impact investors are looking for. Um, then we'll talk directly to two of our nature-based enterprises who have followed two different types of approach to uh, nature-based uh, or to, to scaling. Um, we'll talk to Stefan who has um, secured impact investment and also has a cooperative um, business model um, or cooperative uh, business structure I should say and then we'll talk to Shirley Gleason from Eco Wellness Consulting and the Nodur Centre for Integrative Forest the Therapy and Shirley's gone down an alternative route to scaling which is building an associate network um, I throughout Europe but I think probably globally as well yeah. Um, and finally, then we'll hear from uh, Matthew. Um, and Matthew is uh, from Steinbeis uh, 2i, and um, they're partners in Network Nature, and they're planning some really exciting supports um, to help nature based enterprises uh, grow, uh, also in collaboration with the Enterprise uh, Europe Network. So we have a lot, uh, and we've very little time, so we'll get stuck straight in. And um, Joanne, uh, if I could ask you perhaps maybe to share your screen and um, we'll uh, invite you to give us an overview of this topic. Hello, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to, to be here in the session today. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. While you're sharing that, can I just invite everyone um, to post some questions in chat and in the chat for our speakers as you go through and hopefully we'll have time at the end um, to, to answer those questions. Great. Uh, so indeed, I'm sharing my screen, so I won't see the questions, but I suppose you will share them at the end. So um, to give a little bit of, of background um, before we, we kick off the, the discussions with uh, our representatives of, um, of NBEs today, uh, I'm just going to give a few uh, hints about uh, the, the, the scaling options for nature-based enterprises. Um, I'll talk about uh, scaling routes that are possible, uh, the scaling models that have been identified that are more or less applicable to, to, to nature-based enterprises. Um, 
And also, I'll give a little uh, zoom on the challenges and the enablers and, and to conclude, uh, to open the, the discussion. So um, green is the new black. So yes, there's a huge potential for the NV market to grow. That's I think that's a given. And um, I just connected, so I, I didn't hear the first words. I suppose you just gave an intro on this, uh, Siobhan. Uh, but um, so whether it's the climate and biodiversity um, urgency, the, the funding potential, which is huge, whether it's on the public, private, or, or EU and multi-international uh, uh, um, levels. Um, whether it's the growing momentum for NBS for policymakers, uh, which is growing, or the increasing awareness for citizens, there is a there is a huge potential to grow. The question now is how do we make the uh, nature-based enterprises a new norm? How do we develop viable and scalable business models, um, such as it's the case today for for startups, and how do we enable the uh, startup-like growth? So just a bit more background information uh, regarding funding pot potential. Um, not only scaling NBS is, is urgent, but it also requires massive investments. This is a, this is a given. And just to give a, an idea of the dimensions, uh, 8.1 trillion US dollars is, is the amount, um, according to the State of Finance for Nature reports, that would be required to tackle successfully by 2050 all of the uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation by public and private actors. Uh, also, just also as an introductory remark, um, the IUCN Global Center for NBS puts that criteria number two, uh, the, the importance of scale within the design itself of the NBS. So I'll be talking more about the, the scaling of NBEs, but I wish to, to put this uh, here as something important to have in mind, that scaling within an NBS and therefore for an NBE can be done at different scales. And for the IUCN framework, there's three levels, uh, the parts within the land or seascape, uh, the land or seascape itself, and the wider environment around the, the landscape or seascape. More, more information can be found on the, on the IUCN website. In terms of routes, um, so this is really experience-based and uh, based on all the work we've been doing and the different missions we've been doing at LGI and in my previous uh, uh, experiences, um, there is we've identified so far four types of routes, and then we'll see what are the models that can connect to these different uh, routes. Uh, a first one is to increase the scope uh, locally. Um, so bringing more capacity locally and really increasing the, the scale uh, in, in a specific uh, location. Second one is growing internationally. So we'll talk more about local or multi developing on multi uh, site level um, as we, we see for NBS and for, for nature based um, uh, projects that everything is related really to the local sites. So growing internationally would have to be multi site uh, or has to be multi site the way that we see it. Uh, a third option is to diversify, so developing more solutions, with, which requires more R&D uh, upfront and different ways of funding that. And the fourth one, uh, which is more vertical, is to see what are other functions along the value chain that can be, um, that be, can be developed or acquired uh, by the NBE. Uh, so this is not the official uh, NBE value chain yet, because I think, and I'm giving a glimpse to, to Siobhan, uh, we're, we're working on the nature-based economy model and uh, seeing how we can develop a value chain. Uh, this is just a, a glimpse of what we've done in a study for, for LADEM, um, for the French Environmental um, Transition Agency, uh, where you've got on one side the, the parts of the value chain which are relating to planning and support, and on the other side, the implementation. And I just want to point here that whether uh, NBEs are tackling the, the design or engineering parts or if they're tackling more the operations and local uh, uh, site uh, aspects, the, the scaling models will of course be different. So um, this is I think an open subject for, for research to further define what are the different types of uh, NBE models um, for scaling that can be developed depending on where they're placed on the value chain. In terms of models, uh, here are some examples. So uh, I won't be detailing all of them, and uh, I anyway be going quite fast. Uh, but the three ones, the, the three main ones are impact investment, uh, green bonds. I'd like to mention a little bit, and uh, options for hybridization of uh, gray, green, and blue solutions. 
um, more traditional uh, models that apply to, to NBEs and that have actually applied to NBS in the past without having that name, uh, with, without um, calling it NBS, uh, are cooperatives and uh, franchisee models. And then there's other different types of uh, partnerships that we, we can imagine. Um, here I put the example of a special purpose vehicles that aim at, uh, at uh, developing a specific project uh, in a specific uh, legal entity, uh, whether it's a joint venture or, or not, but really developing a, being focused on a specific asset or project. Um, a few words about uh, cooperatives and franchisee models before I, I then zoom in the, the next three ones. Uh, the next three models um, regarding French, uh, sorry, regarding cooperatives. Uh, it's a model which is which has already been in place for a long time, in particular in the agricultural domain. Uh, what I've experienced um, myself uh, working in particular on system, sustainable agriculture, uh, nature based enterprises is that cooperatives is really a good way to to collectively create and access a market. Uh, when it's especially when it's a, a new market that doesn't exist, um, taking the example, for example, of um, sustainable um, um, agricultural practices in Nepal, where the the organic market is not yet there and it has to be created. Uh, and regarding franchisee models, uh, also with some personal experience uh, in there, it's uh, it really depends on how strict the franchisee model can be in terms of uh, constraints to replicate it. But a very important thing about franchisee models is to make sure that the, the initial business model is solid before trying to replicate it and then provide as much as possible um, support services to for, for the franchisee to replicate the model. A uh, few words regarding, or few slides regarding impact investments. So I suppose most uh, most of you are familiar with it. So the the initial intention is to shift from traditional investment to an investment that has an intention to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside the, the financial uh, return. Uh, there is four key elements that really define impact investing, uh, which is the, the intentionality uh, to have that impact, the financial return that goes with it, the fact that it can tackle a range of asset classes, and you have examples uh, here at the bottom of this slide, and very importantly, the impact measurement part, um, which makes a loop and which enables to, uh, to develop further the impact investment uh, scope. Uh, in terms of trends, um, interestingly, what uh, I found uh, by doing the, the, the latest research was that the market rates, so that investments that have a market rate, um, so different from those that have a below market rate, uh, for example, grants, those with a market rate um, prevail, actually. And there's a emergence of blended finance, which is actually um, the mix between different types of uh, investments. So this is something that's coming out and that's that's being developed these past years and that enables to secure a uh, more or less a combination of more or less risky uh, um, projects. Um, so who is going to do who is going to invest? Uh, it can be uh, financial institutions, banks, uh, pension funds. They'll be really looking at the client investment opportunities, both for individuals and institutions uh, with an interest in, in the social or environmental cause. Um, and these combining uh, both. Uh, it can be institutions, um, family foundations, family offices uh, that will want to leverage their assets by having an impact and while also growing their overall endowment. And it can also be uh, government investors or development finance institutions who will rather come uh, to bring a proof of financial viability uh, for other private sector investors to, to then invest. Um, so these are, this is who, what do they invest in? Uh, this is the, um, the report uh, of the, the GIN, so the Global Impact Investing Network um, of 2020. Uh, as you can see, NBS is not yet identified as a sector and it's normal, it's the, the growing, uh, the sector is being, uh, is being defined, but it really is a cross-cutting uh, theme as we can see uh, the, the amounts of assets uh, in, in, in the topics that stem across energy, water, food agriculture, uh, infrastructure, art and culture. And here doesn't appear, but there's also uh, the, the forest um, sector, which, um, which also is part of the impact investing fields. Um, also importantly, in a, in a survey that was done in 2020 uh, amongst uh, two, uh, more than uh, 250 impact investors, the second intention that they have is to support the development of businesses focused on impact. So 
I directly earmarked here that it's uh, that NBEs would be in included. So there's a big potential for for NBEs to to be um, uh, funded by impact investors. A few words about green bonds, uh, and Shimon, please uh, stop me along the way if I'm taking a bit too long. Uh, they're designed specifically to support uh, specific climate or env environmental projects. It's really the number two uh, reason for or alternative for companies to invest uh, in um, in um, green projects and in particular in, in NBEs for, for the future. As, at least I see this as a huge uh, path. Uh, and they have this tax incentive that makes it very attractive to, to investors. Um, concerning the third path that I want to focus on, which is the, the hybridization of gray, green, blue solutions, uh, several, well, the, the aim is to see, to build alliances with traditional actors to accelerate the transition from gray to green or blue um, by combining or by integrating parts that weren't envisaged uh, initially. There's uh, lots of ways of, of doing it. Uh, it can be uh, by being incubated uh, within a corporation and uh, then spinning off uh, or working as a joint venture or uh, developing to scale uh, after having developed your nature-based enterprise, um, spinning in a large corporation. So thinking about the exit strategy. Joanna, if we could maybe, um, we've got one, one minute left, if, if that would be okay. Yeah. But I mean, Perfect. I have to say this is absolutely fascinating. And it's the first time I've seen a really targeted um, presentation on scaling for nature-based uh, enterprises. So we'll definitely make this available in full afterwards. But yeah. if you maybe just want to even run through the headings for the, the next main parts, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. Um, what I wanted to mention was the challenges for NBs to scale. I think they're quite... Uh, quite obvious, uh, whether it's funding, regulatory aspects, finding the business model, uh, the, the knowledge gap um, uh, regarding the market and the demand, and the fact that it's long term. So thinking of the right strategy. Um, I'll go directly to close uh, to close this on, uh, on what are the enablers and therefore recommendations or tips that I'd like to bring up for NBEs to scale. Um, number one is really to seek all of these uh, innovative funding and partnership opportunities uh, that I mentioned, and it's just a, a few. Um, important also is to create bottom-up demand and acceptance for NBS and co-create with stakeholders in a participatory manner. That's really a key key things to, to be able to scale by embarking everybody uh, along the way. Setting up action-oriented partnerships with new sectors and actors uh, to whom the NBS can offer solutions. Another leverage um, lever or enabler is engaging with the technology or the innovation sector uh, that can help to, to develop enabling tools, uh, whether it's um, mobile apps, platforms, or um, climate services, for example. And uh, finally, really connecting to capacity building structures or, or networks. And uh, last, promoting your solutions with great marketing. I've got an example on the right side of um, Merci Raymond, a French NBE that has been uh, really appreciated by, uh, by companies and, and partners to, to work with. And so making it sexy, making NBE sexy was the keyword of uh, those promoting these solutions. So as a conclusion, one size doesn't fit all. Um, define what's your target scale, how much, what, size, what type of scale you want to, to reach. Uh, benchmark the similar uh, organizations that have advanced on that path and choose the right people to, to grow with. That would be my key closing remarks. Thanks a lot and um, hope I wasn't too long. Um, that was fantastic. Really, uh, really very helpful setting the stage uh, for the, the discussion here today. We'll definitely make that presentation um, available uh, as, as soon as possible because I know there will be a lot of, it, it was quite comprehensive, I have to say. Um, so yeah, really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is we're going to have a conversation um, with a uh, column uh, on the subject of impact investors and then we'll talk to Shirley on this franchise models that you mentioned and then we'll talk to Stefan about uh, the cooperative model which overlaps with the impact investment model which are some of the models that you presented at the very start there in terms of scaling models so we'll maybe have a chat um, directly with some of the enterprises that were involved in this but just to your last point in terms of about the importance of good marketing I think there was a really good example in the last session in financing 
MPs where we had Matthew from Mossy Earth. I don't know if anybody heard that, but he was talking about how he was actually uh, contacting ambassadors and social media to really market his brand uh, for him. And that was also helpful for him in securing impact investment. So that's definitely a really good advice. And I see we have hands here uh, in the chat. And again, I know that those uh, that the guys in Helix are also very good at marketing. And there's a lot of interest at the moment, including in financial institutions, dare I say, like banks, in, um, you know, in supporting um, these uh, types of um, kind of nature-based enterprises um, because there's a positive associations with their brand as well. So I know that's worked for a number of nature-based enterprises. But maybe if we go back, first of all, um, to one of those subjects of impact investment. So I know there's a lot of interest in this area, but there's also a lot of concerns. Um, you know, will the, how do we align the interests of the impact investors with the mission orientation of a nature-based enterprise? So Colm, maybe if I could ask you, first of all, you've been working very closely with Fledge, um, a US impact investor, um, who backed some of the enterprises in your uh, first uh, EcoStar Accelerator program. Could I ask you maybe just to tell us a little bit about uh, the EcoStar Accelerator Programme and how this relationship with Fledge came about in the first place? Um, and good afternoon, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the EcoStar, EcoStar is a hub. It's like um, essentially a, a hub of different products and services that aim to sort of train and facilitate uh, enhancement and 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 and, and uh, acceleration of of, of nature-based business models. Uh, it grew out of um, a European-funded project, whereby through some very uh, targeted uh, networking activities, um, it was actually uh, noticed by uh, very randomly uh, this this impact investor at one of our targeted uh, networking activities, who liked the the package. Of services that the hub had to offer from from everything from yes from uh, workshops to so entrepreneurship workshops to e-learning online workshops for entrepreneurs in nature-based businesses and enterprises to the accelerator model itself and was quite impressed with the accelerator model that we had and said hey I'm going to invest in in, in this as part of my my franchise which is the the Fledge series. And can I ask what specific criteria that Fred, Fledge were looking for in terms of an investment? I think Joanne pointed out some of the things that an impact investor might be looking for. But from your experience, what were the key criteria that, that Fledge were looking for? Yeah, it's 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 a very a very good question. Um, I mean, Fledge started out as more of a social uh, impact investor. We were for, sort of one of the first trials where we were bringing in this this the nature element to to their um, their series of accelerators. Um, so they kept from what they were looking for in their original franchise model. They kept many of the criteria, uh, the original criteria, which most importantly for them at a very sort of humane level is the, the, the strength and the quality of the team, um, the credibility of the team, the, the entrepreneurs um, that and then there are so there are sort of qual, uh, qualitative and then maybe quantitative aspects from which the, the investor may may look at the business model perspectives from which they may they may look at the business model another one is the level of competition that exists already in the market for that particular model another one is capital need so really like if this if, if the model is asking or positioning itself at the right capital request uh, in that accelerator um, things like traction as well so current revenues and uh, whether the, the the model is at idea stage prototype or, or actually generating revenue or out of the value of debt so to speak um, and just the last point i guess is well where ecostar came in so these would be all sort of classical more uh, the, the social um, the social approach to to selection criteria eco started went a little bit further and looked at things like uh, the sustainability uh, environmental sustainability and impact of the model so we were looking at whether or not the the business models incorporated some kinds of quality standards quality assurance or certification schemes for um for for the, the 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 resources depending on the products or services that they were they were de de designing their business model on 
Great. Okay. And and would I be right in saying that not all of the enterprises in the, you know, the EcoStar um, were successful in securing impact investment? Uh, and, and if so, what were, were there any other interesting models that the other kind of enterprises in that first wave or even subsequent ways of, of enterprises um, secured, uh, where they secured um, kind of what was their approach to scaling, I suppose? Yeah, uh, they, well, no, they all, they were all selected, shortlisted. So we had about, I mean, 300 applications of startups from all over the world. Uh, and the eight selected, so the shortlisted were actually um, all funded. So they all received impact investment. Um, and uh, the, 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 the point probably more interestingly is some presented a, a sort of an idea or a, a project and then the, the investor was actually uh, investing in because they were equity investments um, they were essentially in, investing in maybe the, the enterprise, the legally incorporated incorporated enterprise that stood behind the project. So they were trying to relaunch maybe another startup through, through, through the project. Um, Oh, does that answer the question? Yeah, no, no, I think yeah. it does. I think it does. Um, and I think it always goes back to a common question we had. I was on the Glasgow Accelerator program last week and one of the questions was, what legal form should we take in order to be able to, um, you know, secure impact investment down the line? Because in the, in this Accelerator program, they were... Um, you know, very much a concept early stage. And so they hadn't really decided what kind of legal structure they should be. And um, one of the questions was around, well, what are your future plans for scaling? So from what you're saying there, um, you know, it would seem that, um, or maybe I should ask you, what would you say to somebody in that situation in terms of what would be the best legal form to allow for future uh, impact investment? Yeah, really. Um, I mean, that that again depends on on sort of many factors. Like we we were in EcoStar, we were really looking at uh, existing legally incorporated enterprises, but then they did they did um, because otherwise you can't work with the equity model. Um, but the investor did actually sort of. Uh, in this case, approve of two two projects that were proposed, but then with the the, the, the sort of the grounding of the, the legally incorporated enterprise standing behind the project. Um, however, if you have sort of if you're behind and you're at prototype or even idea stage and you're looking for funding, um, really the everything from sort of we've seen there was one very interesting application that was with them looking at insect based products and that were bootstrapping their way along until EcoStar um, and managed to secure more recently a very interesting um, a very interesting contract with Sainsbury supermarkets the first of its kind and uh, uh, the first product as well to be to be put on the supermarket shelves in in, in, in in the UK so a very interesting result for them and since EcoStar since they joined EcoStar in 2018 they had been bootstrapping between now between then and now until they got this contract, living very cheaply, all the four guys together in an apartment, essentially funding themselves, going from um, also through angel investment as well, for example, and, and also through family, uh, getting sort of small investments from families as well, not actually selling big product, prod, uh, numbers of products until this contract with Sainsbury. And then there are other models that go from they jump from accelerator to accelerator. We had other we had other startups that literally they would use the accelerators as their business model. You know, they would use the investment yeah. until, they, until they were able to um, sustainably uh, fund themselves. OK. Um, yes, indeed. And I'm going to ask Joanne as well um, for her experience in that. But I see an interesting question coming through here on the chat. Um, so I, I, I think Panaki um, was asking, which is literally the question we were just discussing there, are MBEs more private limited companies, uh, LLPs are public companies, any data for the EU? Um, I, again, I think Esme could possibly best answer that because um, Esme has, uh, she's coordinating the chat there, but I know that Esme has led on research and maybe she could add um, our uh, research paper into the chat there, um, which maybe looks at uh, legal form um, or has some data on that. And I think we green also have as well. But um, if I recall correctly, 
um, from our research, it shows that most companies are private limited companies. Um, uh, but again, Esme will perhaps be able to better clarify that. Does anybody else in the panel uh, know the answer to that, just statistically speaking? Um, I think our research, and I, I, there was about 150 enterprises from across Europe, showed that um, I think the majority were private limited companies. But Esme, please feel free to put into the chat the answer on that. Um, there was also a really interesting question from Stuart there, um, which maybe Joanne, I can put to you first. Um, from your experience, um, or you know, in terms of the scaling models that you were presenting and your um, the slides on impact investment, where investors expecting purely financial return um, on their investment or also social environmental return? And I'll ask you first, Joanne, and then Colm, I might bring you in very quickly to answer that as well. Uh, Joanne, I think you're muted. Perfect. Yeah, and just to be sure about it's um, within a, a specific NBE, what's the part where they would expect? So it was, a, it was a question from Stuart, and I think it was mm -hmm. uh, regarding impact investors in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Are they expecting purely financial returns on their investment, okay. or do they also actually specifically look for social and environmental returns? I seem to recall you had a slide up which you said, yeah, here's what the impact definitely. investors are looking for. I, wasn't, I wanted to make sure I understood well the, the question. Uh, the, the, the purpose, the intention uh, of having a social and environmental return is really number one for impact investors, uh, but it has to go together with a, a financial return, which is more or less risky according to the, as you could see, the, the, the cursor, um, depending on where you position the cursor on, on the level of risk and whether it's market level which is the which is going to be uh, the same kind of risk as as markets um, as traditional uh, investments uh, versus lower than the market investments uh, which will be grants or or other situations where the risk is much higher um, for and therefore the objective to to support the, the social and environmental uh, aspect is is higher but yeah, by definition, impact investors have a social and environmental return as number one, and 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 this that's why the the fourth uh, aspect that I mentioned, which is the impact measurement, is is really key, mm -hmm. um, because it's much harder to have a tangible view on what are the results, and uh, this is something which is developing more and more with um with a framework that has been developed by the by the gin. I think yeah. it's called the IRIS model. Yes, so. that's right. And um, also, I would say that the uh, handbook on measuring impact uh, that was recently produced in the last two months by the Commission, and I think it was some of the best attended sessions here, are how do you measure impact? And um, because that has been a key issue all along, really kind of limiting the growth of nature based solutions is this ability to measure those different impacts. So those indicate that handbook, if I don't know if anybody has the link that they could put up to it, but that is a really useful, I suppose, support as well. Um, and we would hope that investors will be looking towards that as, if you like, the definitive way of measuring impact mm -hmm. in these areas, combined with, as you said, the IUCN Global Standard, which is also a very useful um, tool. Yeah. Colm, maybe, um, and uh, Stefan, I know also I might actually ask you for your experience because you've also got impact investors on board. So, Colm, very briefly, and then we'll go to Stefan as well for a brief response on that. Yeah, I, I don't have too much more to add. I think Joanne answered that question very well. I just might be like turn it around from the perspective of the investor and say, well, the impact is in the model that they're investing in, but of course they're looking for financial return. Um, and uh, certainly the, again, our experience from a cohort of uh, and getting to know these investors from a cohort of maybe eight startups, they're happy if one startup in 10 years time is 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 actually doing well one two startups this is this is this is these are the kind of numbers that we were we were um try understanding from from the impact investor we were looking we were working with um very interestingly um but maybe quite obviously uh, we had three three african startups on our first cohort and they are currently, apart from this one that I mentioned with the, the insects uh, in, in the UK, they're currently the only uh, three uh, organizations, nature-based enterprises that are still actually um, that are still actually functioning. And they're actually doing really, really well and have secured big investments through, through Ecostar. 
Excellent. So Aquas, African, it's easier to translate, I guess, the impact as well. And the impact is often easier to communicate as well, investing in African startups. That's really interesting perspective. Stefan, just to very briefly, if we come to you, because from your perspective, um, you've got impact investors investing in a cooperative model. Would you say environmental um, or social or economic returns are the most important? Our case, so we are wood cooperative. We're producing a, a locally sourced uh, wood for the metropolitan area of Brussels, and uh, uh, we worked with uh, three different uh, impact investors uh, um, that uh, became member of the cooperative uh, uh, invested uh, uh, in the cooperative as well. And uh, uh, each of these uh, impact investments had a different profile. So, so, so one was really interested in more social impact, and they us to cooperate with social economy actors from the metropolitan area. Uh, others were interested uh, uh, more in, in uh, environmental impact. Um, but, but I would say uh, uh, maybe an additional uh, additional element, all three impact investors were interested in, in, in local impact. So they had a geographical scope. They were interested that we develop something that has an added value to a specific geographical area. And I think that this is made like in addition to social, environmental and economic, uh, sometimes they also have like a geographical geographical scope that is uh, obviously for us a big, uh, a big part of our pitch. We, we, we say that we can deliver something in this geographical scope because we are from here and, and uh, uh, that was that was really quite important. Afterwards, uh, um, I must say that uh, once the negotiation was over and we, we showed the indicators that we would uh, uh, pursue uh, for social, environmental and economic impact, uh, 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 one of the impact investors came, came back to us and said, well, do focus now on the economic bit because we want you to, to deliver and we want you to work and, and and the social impact can also be like a maybe a bit further in the future right now like make sure that the business model works and uh, uh, that we get the finance uh, uh, you know resulted out especially in the grow phase and then uh, uh, maybe things that are not essential to what you're doing now uh, can come back later uh, uh, and, and, and two or three years. I think that was also interesting. Uh, uh, you know that they are, that there's some some flexibility and also on what they can expect. As as long as they made that clear, I think before you signed any agreement with them, uh, rather than further down the line. Okay, thank you, Stefan. And please stay with us. Um, uh, we'll come back with some some more questions uh, because I think this cooperative model also is is really interesting. Um, but I will, maybe if we leave to uh, impact investment to one side for a moment, because there are alternative models to impact investment as well. And at this stage, I'd like to bring um, Shirley Gleason in. Um, and some of you may, might have met. Shirley yesterday. She's our ambassador for the uh, nature-based solutions community in the area of health and well-being. Um, but Shirley, you haven't gone down the impact investment route. Um, before we go to, uh, we ask you about your investment route, maybe if you tell us a little bit about your enterprise, where you are so far and how you've uh, grown to date. Sure. So uh, just to say a little bit about my background, my background is in mental health, social work, health promotion. So I have no business background. Um, in 2015, I left social work and, and started up as a sole trader um, in the area of training uh, health professionals for nature based interventions. And then I worked with Social Entrepreneurs Ireland uh, for a couple of years and I got some seed funding to start um, to start up and I set up the limited company, Eco Wellness Consulting. Um, but all along for the last 10 years, I've been going to international conferences, doing different international training. So I've really developed a strong international uh, network. Um, so um, we didn't need uh, impact investment. Um, because we, um, I'd say 80% of our funding initially came from private payers for trainings. Uh, so we trained people from over 35, 40 different countries in forest bathing, forest therapy. Uh, we developed a number of income streams from uh, nature based uh, workplace well being um, to the whole area of forest bathing for ecotourism to uh, train in health environmental practitioners in, in forest uh, therapy interventions. Um, so we were lucky because there was not a lot of people um, or companies operating in the space. Um, so I think we uh, grew organically. Uh, we have a number of, of trainers and consultants working with us um, now from a number of uh, European countries. Um, and we also have um, a number of local institutes. We set one up in, in, in Chile um, and, and around Europe. We've trained people in, 
Australia. We've had people come over uh, from the Himalayas uh, to train. So I think our, our overheads were low. Uh, we developed good partnerships. We have uh, partnerships with MIND. It's the, one of the UK's largest mental health charities that we run training through. We've also a partnership with the Scottish Scottish Forestry. They're uh, part of the Scottish government responsible for forestry policy. Um, so we developed strong uh, networks and we have um, a franchise model now where we operate a train the trainer program uh, for people that we've trained uh, so they can offer the training in their own countries, which uh, are adapted to the culture and costs within those countries. And th th that's really interesting. Um, so, so would you say then that it, the the franchise um, network allowed that you've adopted, or that franchise approach, has allowed you to scale as rapidly as you would like? Um, do you think it's an effective model? Um, I think it's it's hard to scale. Uh, I think um, they, there's a lack of skill set there in terms of um, people that are really skilled in this area. So I think that has hampered our development. Um, but we've also been uh, quite overwhelmed with the level of interest, <laughs> you know, in this area. Um, so um, I think at the start we did grow rapidly, but now we need more sustained growth, um, uh, ethical growth. Um, I think there were some ethical issues coming up in this field, you know, in terms of commercial business versus social business versus environmental ethics. Um, so, um, so I think um, where we are at the moment is more sustainable in, in terms of our growth. Uh, excellent. And, and would you say, or if I could again just ask you, at a future stage, is there anything or any concerns you would have about impact investment? Um, is there is there anything that would be, you know, you would see as a barrier apart from, you know, you mentioned skill sets there, but uh, you also mentioned ethical routes to growth. Is there, do you have any concerns that um, about impact investment at some stage in the future? No, not, not at all. I think it's just such an unknown area uh, for, for me, you know, um, because again, I don't have that, that background in business. So I think, um, you know, as long as we can ma maintain control over our ethics and standards and quality assurance, um, I think that will be the most important thing um, and that we were all working um, in the same direction. Great stuff. Okay, that's that's good to know. It's always good to have a different um, perspective. Um, Stefan, if I could just go back to you now, I see there's a question there in the chat. I might just put it to you. Um, uh, the minimum time frame which investors are looking for returns to commence after their first tranche. Maybe if I could ask you in your context, um, what about the, you know, what's your experience of that? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the, 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 the growth phase or the phase uh, of development that the organization is in. I think at the beginning, you would, uh, like if your organization is at the beginning, uh, you would look at a time frame of maybe three to five years, which was, which was our case. Uh, and then as your as your organization uh, grows more mature i think the time frame then uh, becomes becomes longer than you're maybe looking at investments uh, for for 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. we we signed agreements with our impact investments uh, uh, that they would stay in the cooperative uh, uh, for for uh, for around 4 to 5 years i think yeah, and actually, I, I see there's a couple of other questions coming in here. I'm, I'm keen to go to Matthew for his presentation first, but we'll come back at the end. We should hopefully have a couple a time for a few more questions if you want to add them into the chat. That would be great. Um, but uh, Stefan, I'm, I'm curious a little bit in terms of the cooperative business model, because we had this discussion earlier about what type of structure. Uh, and very often there's this perception that you need to have like a, a limited company structure to allow you to take a, a, an equity or investors to take an equity stake. But in the cooperative model, how does that work? Um, are, how did you manage to attract investors when they're not being able to take an equity stake? Uh, well, they can. Huh? It's not uh, incompatible with the with the cooperative model. Huh? Maybe just uh, to, to say two or three words about what a cooperative is. Uh, um, so, so in general, uh, um, a cooperative serves uh, uh, a specific purpose uh, uh, for a specific group of people. And the specificity of a cooperative is that the group of people that benefit from the cooperative uh, uh, own the cooperative or have a very large stake in, in their functioning. So this can be a, a supermarket that is owned by the by the by the customers mm -hmm. of the supermarket or a factory that is owned by the workers. Factory. So uh, uh, it's 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 the government's model where the users have a lot of rights. 
uh, in our case, uh, um, we uh, we are not a, 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 we we are a cooperative that is a, a co-producer cooperative because there was a lot of different steps along the value chain from uh, uh, from trees to uh, final products in wood. Uh, so the cooperative model that we uh, uh, that we set up uh, um, uh, is, 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 a, is a collaboration between uh, different independent actors along the value chain uh, that work together within the cooperative. Excellent. So in addition, uh, uh, in addition to uh, uh, these these uh, these co-producers, we also created a specific category of shares that are financial partners uh, because we considered them also as important uh, partners of the value chain, huh? like uh, so, some people have machines, some people have skills, some people have money. Uh, so created a specific share of uh, 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 like a specific class of, of, of shares in the cooperative for financial partners. And then we could uh, uh, start negotiating with uh, uh, in order to subscribe these shares. And the cooperative uh, statutes can then, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 um, apply different uh, different rules and obligations also for different classes of uh, of shares. Uh, in our case, this is not the case. But uh, 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 the fact of being a cooperative does not uh, exclude uh, that you work with impact mm -hmm. investors that then buy shares of the of the cooperative. Um, okay, thank you for the clarification. And I think it probably goes back to what Joanne was saying in her models earlier. She was saying that, you know, the cooperative model has um, been used quite a lot in these other kind of co-production areas. So uh, regenerative agriculture, sustainable forestry, the areas where there's, um, you know, a large kind of amount of um, capital being tied up in the production chain. It seems to be a very um, relevant model. Um, okay, excellent. Thank you for, to uh, Shirley and Stefan for giving us a, a, a brief overview of the kind of model that you've taken to scaling. What I might do, if you could ask you to stay with us for a moment, but I'll hand over to Matthew um, and ask Matthew perhaps just to share some information about what Network Nature are doing. So Network Nature um, are um, I hope I'm not going to um, be uh, telling everybody what uh, the your introduction, uh, Matthew, but uh, Network Nature are the uh, collaborative project that kind of represents all of the different projects like Connecting Nature, Regreen. So all of the projects that the 20 plus projects that the European Commission have funded are all kind of represented, if you like, collectively by uh, Network Nature. Um, so Na uh, Matthew, if I could ask you perhaps to, I'll hand over to you and ask you to tell us what you're going to do to help grow nature-based enterprises. Thank you very much, Shavan. I hope everybody can hear me and see my screen now. Um, in my presentation, so I'm Mathieu Grosjean, I'm working at uh, Steinbeis 2i GmbH in uh, Stuttgart, and uh, there are also a place in uh, Karlsruhe. Um, what I will uh, discuss about is a short description of what network, network nature is as a complementary element for what uh, Shavan just said. And uh, then I will uh, explain a little bit what is uh, Enterprise Europe Network and which are the synergies that uh, the different uh, nature-based uh, enterprises and uh, the organization interested in nature-based uh, solutions uh, can benefit from. And then I will speak about another initiative that we are uh, about to start uh, in relationship with Network Nature, which is the nature-based solution businesses national representatives so let's start with the introduction and the uh, short movie uh, related or presenting network nature. I... Can you do that? I can't, but maybe I'll ask her to play the video for us. Um, yeah. Worked at the test beforehand, so hopefully it'll work now. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Here we go. Thank you.
So normally, uh, I will now make a little short uh, focus on the on the business part. Um, for the business part, we want to support a nature based solution uh, interested organization to join the movement or further grow their business and uh, for startup to reach the value of death. And uh, therefore, I will present some further initiatives uh, that we are uh, wanting to develop. And in the meantime, just let me introduce what Anthropology of Network is, because it is part of one of our uh, initiatives. Um, here you can see Anthropology of Europe Network is um, a huge uh, network of uh, 600 partners uh, in over 60 different countries in the world. And um, we are um, focusing on supporting uh, SMEs and, uh, and startups um, in developing their uh, business and uh, getting some contacts or exchanges or developing synergies with other SMEs um, related to business or uh, technology interest. Therefore, there are several cooperation profiles which are developed by the different SMEs uh, uh, supported by the, by the member of the network. And uh, these cooperation profiles are uh, brought on the database, uh, which enables to uh, get in touch with other uh, organizations uh, related or connected to the Enterprise Road Network. Uh, Enterprise Road Network is also um, supporting the development of several uh, brokerage events, um, uh, conferences, uh, and other, other uh, fairs uh, to uh, make sure that uh, the different uh, partners or related partners can exchange and uh, further uh, connect. And uh, we are also supporting uh, on the IP related uh, questions. So let's move to uh, the third idea is um, we would like to develop or the initiative of Network Nature uh, in a relationship with the synergies uh, with uh, Enterprise Europe Network. Here you can see what we, uh, what we want to offer, uh, the natural-based solution interested businesses. Uh, so uh, to present them uh, what Enterprise Europe Network is and what are the different opportunities that uh, this uh, network uh, offers. We will there uh, support uh, by the fund in this way the different natural based uh, solution interested organizations uh, in uh, internationalizing and uh, to uh, develop some uh, cooperation profiles themselves to benefit from the one which are already existing in the database uh, to uh, inform them about the different uh, events which are. Um, happening everywhere in the world and which are in relationship with uh, natural based solutions and uh, and support them in uh, joining these events and really taking part and also uh, supporting them in how to get in touch uh, or create uh, uh, create uh, exchanges or uh, develop bilateral exchanges with the different uh, organizations taking part uh, to these events so here, yes, in a few words, I think I won't come back on this. I just mentioned it on the on the slide before. Uh, just the point is that, uh, of course, the idea is uh, there to have to create this exchange, and uh, we would be that we will be there to support you in uh, joining uh, this and benefiting from enterprise Europe network. Another initiative uh, that we uh, we are about to. Uh, set up is uh, this uh, network of national representatives for business interested in natural solutions. The idea is there to uh, develop uh, a European network uh, for um, the different uh, where we would have some uh, national contact points or national national uh, entities uh, which are here to support the different uh, businesses um, within the different uh, countries and to support them in advising them, uh, to support them by informing them about what are the activities at the moment, what they can benefit from, uh, what are the different initiatives uh, which are addressing them, 
the different uh, funding opportunities or the different financing opportunities which are uh, in the different countries and so on. Uh, that for we would have uh, we will have um, uh, uh, space on the network nature platform uh, where we will have different uh, information, different tools, different trainings, seminars um, to support uh, the to support uh, the, this movement uh, towards uh, nature based solutions or this uh, this grow of uh, the different nature based enterprises or the different uh, enterprises interested in natural based solutions and these uh, members of this uh, these members of this uh, uh, network who will uh, meet themselves regularly uh, to exchange on trends and barriers uh, related to uh, business interested in natural based solutions to develop policy recommendations uh, but also to uh, update uh, information about uh, financing uh, related to natural based solutions but also new conferences and brokerage events that would happen in the different parts of uh, Europe. This is in a in, in very very short, uh, short time uh, what I wanted to say about uh, Network Nature and uh, the initiatives uh, to support uh, natural based solution uh, interested organizations or enterprises. I will pass to the floor Back to Shovan. Thank you, um, for um, that introduction. I know it was short, but I think it's really important as well that we raise awareness among existing networks about nature-based enterprises. I mean, it's a relatively new concept, but as we've seen, it encompasses a number of different, um, you know, economic sectors that are already there, like from forestry to regenerative agriculture and so on. But uh, I know that um, many of the, the nature-based enterprises that we've spoken to um, really resonate with uh, this term. So I think within the EEN network and within the NCP network that you're doing, there's a really important opportunity to raise awareness through those type of uh, brokerage events and networking events. And um, I think that that's a fantastic work. Um, we've only one minute uh, left, I'm afraid. So um, I am, and I can see through the chat here that any of the questions have been very efficiently answered by our speakers so thank you uh, very much to our panel today for answering those questions very efficiently and um, thank you to Joanne for your introductory presentation I um, I found it really interesting to provide to have this framework I think for all of the different scaling options and um, no doubt it will become a reference in time and um, I'd like to thank Shirley and uh, Stefan for from the MBE perspective from uh, for introducing your different models I'll let you go back on holidays now, Stefan, but thank you for joining us. Colm, as always, it is really great to get your insights. You were the first on the block, if you like, um, with the EcoStar incubator, or, or sorry, accelerator. And um, you continue to do great work in many other areas. And I know that yourself and Shirley are very active along with us now in the area of nature for health and well-being. So um, it's really great if we can get and raise the interest of the impact investors in this area. And finally, Finally, as we said, thank you, Matthew, for closing the session here today um, with a little taste of the things to come when we really get succeed in getting nature-based enterprises and the nature-based economy on the agendas of the kind of mainstream uh, policymakers um, in DG Enterprise. So we have a bit of a way to go, but I think we've done a, had a really good start today um, with this session and with the summit. So thank you all. And please, we invite you to stay with us. And uh, there's some MBEs pitching straight after this. So I know they would love your support. And then we'll uh, wrap up with a little taster of what's going to come in Genk from the uh, Deputy Mayor there. So please stay with us. Um, we're going straight into the other session. So no more breaks, I think. Um, but we'll be wrapped up in an hour or two. Thank you again to our wonderful panel. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you all. Siobhan, it's me. Bye. Bye.